This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons, Naperville, Illinois. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 5. Chapter 14. To 15. Chapter 14. Wherein are inserted the despairing verses of the dead shepherd, together with other incidents not looked for. The Lay of Chrysostom. Since thou dost in thy cruelty desire the ruthless rigor of thy tyranny, from tongue to tongue, from land to land proclaimed, the very hell will I constrain to lend this stricken breast of mine deep notes of woe to serve my need of fitting utterance and as i strive to body forth the tale of all i suffer all that thou hast done forth shall the dread voice roll and bear along shreds from my vitals torn for greater pain then listen not to dulcet harmony but to a discord wrung by mad despair out of this bosom's depths of bitterness to ease my heart and plant a sting in thine the lion's roar the fierce wolf's savage howl the horrid hissing of the scaly snake the awesome cries of monsters yet unnamed the crow's ill-boding croak the hollow moan of wild winds wrestling with the restless sea the wrathful bellow of the vanquished bull the plaintive sobbing of the widowed dove the envied owl's sad note the wail of woe that rises from the dreary choir of hell commingled in one sound confusing sense let all these come to aid my soul's complaint for pain like mine demands new modes of song no echoes of that discord shall be heard where father tagus rolls or on the banks of ollard bordered betis to the rocks or in deep caverns shall my plaint be told and by a lifeless tongue in living words or in dark valleys or on lonely shores where neither foot of man nor sunbeam falls or in among the poison-breathing swarms of monsters nourished by the sluggish nile for though it be to solitudes remote the hoarse vague echoes of my sorrows sound thy matchless cruelty my dismal fate shall carry them to all the spacious world disdain hath power to kill and patience dies slain by suspicion be it false or true and deadly is the force of jealousy long absence make makes of life a dreary void no hope or happiness can give repose to him that ever fears to be forgot and death inevitable waits in hall but i by some strange miracle live on a prey to absence jealousy disdain racked by suspicion as by certainty forgotten left to feed my flame alone and while i suffer thus there comes no ray of hope to gladden me athwart the gloom nor do i look for it in my despair but rather clinging to a cureless woe all hope do i abjure for evermore can there be hope where fear is were it well when far more certain are the grounds of fear ought i to shut mine eyes to jealousy if through a thousand heart wounds it appears who would not give free access to distrust seeing disdain unveiled and bitter change all his suspicions turn to certainties and the fair truth transformed into a lie 
O oh, thou fierce tyrant of the realms of love! O oh, jealousy, put chains upon these hands, and bind me with thy strongest cord. Disdain! But woe is me, triumphant over all! My sufferings drown the memory of you. And now I die, and since there is no hope of happiness for me in life or death, still to my fantasy I'll fondly cling, I'll say that he is wise who loveth well, and that the soul most free is that most bound in thraldom to the ancient tyrant love. I'll say that she who is mine enemy in that fair body hath as fair a mind, and that her coldness is but my desert, and that by virtue of the pain he sends love rules his kingdom with a gentle sway. Thus self-deluding, and in bondage sore, and wearing out the wretched shred of life to which I am reduced by her disdain, I'll give this soul and body to the winds, all hopeless of a crown of bliss in store. Thou, whose injustice hath supplied the cause that makes me quit the weary life I loathe, as by this wounded bosom thou canst see, how willingly thy victim I become. Let not my death, if haply worth a tear, cloud the clear heaven that dwells in thy bright eyes. I would not have thee expiate in aught the crime of having made my heart thy prey, but rather let thy laughter gaily ring, and prove my death to be thy festival. Fool that I am to bid thee, well I know thy glory gains by my untimely end. And now it is the time from hell's abyss come thirsting Tantalus, come Sisyphus, heaving the cruel stone, come Tityus with vulture and with wheel Ixion come, and come the sisters of the ceaseless toil and all into this breast transfer their pains, and, if such tribute to despair be due, chant in their deepest tones a doleful dirge over a course unworthy of a shroud. Let the three-headed guardian of the gate, and all the monstrous progeny of hell, the doleful concert join, a lover dead, methinks can have no fitter obsequies. Lay of despair, grieve not, when thou art gone, forth from this sorrowing heart, my misery brings fortune to the cause that gave thee birth. Then banish sadness even in the tomb. The lay of Chrysostom met with the approbation of the listeners, though the reader said it did not seem to him to agree with what he had heard of Marcella's reserve and propriety. For Chrysostom complained in it of jealousy, suspicion, and absence, all to the prejudice of the good name and fame of Marcella, to which Ambrosio replied, as one who knew well his friend's most secret thoughts, Senor, to remove that doubt, I should tell you that when the unhappy man wrote this lay, he was away from Marcella, from whom he had voluntarily separated himself, to try if absence would act with him as it is wont, and as everything distresses and every fear haunts the banished lover, so imaginary jealousies and suspicions dreaded as if they were true, tormented Chrysostom, and thus the truth of what report declares of the virtue of Marcella remains unshaken, and with her envy itself should not and cannot find any fault save that of being cruel, somewhat haughty, and very scornful. That is true, said Vivaldo, and as he was about to read another paper of those he had preserved from the fire, he was stopped by a marvellous vision, for such it seemed, 
that unexpectedly presented itself to their eyes, for on the summit of the rock where they were digging the grave there appeared the shepherdess Marcella, so beautiful that her beauty exceeded its reputation. Those who had never till then beheld her gazed upon her in wonder and silence, and those who were accustomed to see her were not less amazed than those who had never seen her before. But the instant Ambrosio saw her, he addressed her with manifest indignation. Art thou come by chance, cruel basilisk of these mountains, to see if in thy presence blood will flow from the wounds of this wretched being thy cruelty has robbed of life? Or is it to exult over the cruel work of thy humours that thou art come? Or like another pitiless Nero, to look down from that height upon the ruin of his Rome in embers? Or in thy arrogance to trample on this ill-fated corpse, as the ungrateful daughter trampled on her father Tarkins? Tell us quickly, for what thou art come, or what it is thou wouldst have, for, as I know the thoughts of Chrysostom never fail to obey thee in life, I will make all these who call themselves his friends obey thee, though he be dead. I come not, Ambrosia, for any of the purposes thou hast named, replied Marcella, but to defend myself and to prove how unreasonable are all those who blame me for their sorrow and for Chrysostom's death, and therefore I ask all of you that are here to give me your attention, for will not take much time or many words to bring the truth home to persons of sense. Heaven has made me, so you say, beautiful, and so much so that in spite of yourselves my beauty leads you to love me and for the love you show me, you say, and even urge, that I am bound to love you. By that natural understanding which God has given me, I know that everything beautiful attracts love, but I cannot see how, by reason of being loved, that which is loved for its beauty is bound to love that which loves it. Besides, it may happen that the lover of that which is beautiful may be ugly, and ugliness being detestable, it is very absurd to say, I love thee because thou art beautiful, thou must love me though I be ugly. But supposing the beauty equal on both sides, it does not follow that the inclinations must be therefore alike, for it is not every beauty that excites love, some but pleasing the eye without winning the affection. And if every sort of beauty excited love and won the heart, the will would wander vaguely to and fro, unable to make choice of any, for as there is an infinity of beautiful objects, there must be an infinity of inclinations. And true love, I have heard it said, is indivisible, and must be voluntary and not compelled." If this be so, as I believe it to be, why do you desire me to bend my will by force, for no other reason but that you say you love me? Nay, tell me, had heaven made me ugly, as it has made me beautiful, could I with justice complain of you for not loving me? Moreover, you must remember that the beauty I possess was no choice of mine, for, be it what it may, heaven of its bounty gave it me without my asking or choosing it and as the viper though it kills with it does not deserve to be blamed for the poison it carries as it is a gift of nature neither do i deserve reproach for being beautiful for beauty in a modest woman is like fire at a distance or a sharp sword the one does not burn the other does not cut those who do not come too near, honor and virtue are the ornaments of the mind, without which the body, though it be so, 
has no right to pass for beautiful. But if modesty is one of the virtues that specially lend a grace and charm to mind and body, why should she who is loved for her beauty part with it to gratify one who for his pleasure alone strives with all his might and energy to rob her of it? I was born free, and that I might live in freedom, I chose the solitude of the fields. In the trees of the mountains I find society. The clear waters of the brooks are my mirrors, and to the trees and waters I make known my thoughts and charms. I am a fire afar off, a sword laid aside. Those whom I have inspired with love by letting them see me, I have by words undeceived, and if their longings live on hope, and I have given none to Chrysostom or to any other, it cannot justly be said that the death of any is my doing, for it was rather his own obstinacy than my cruelty that killed him. And if it be made a charge against me that his wishes were honourable, and that therefore I was bound to yield to them, I answer that when on this very spot where now his grave is made he declared to me his purity of purpose, I told him that mine was to live in perpetual solitude, and that the earth alone should enjoy the fruits of my retirement and the spoils of my beauty, and if, after this open avowal, he chose to persist against hope and steer against the wind, what wonder is it that he should sink in the depths of his infatuation? If I had encouraged him, I should be false. If I had gratified him, I should have acted against my own better resolution and purpose. He was persistent in spite of warning. He despaired without being hated. But think you now, if it be reasonable, that his suffering should be laid to my charge. Let him who has been deceived complain. Let him give way to despair, whose encouraged hopes have proved vain. Let him flatter himself, whom I shall entice. Let him boast, whom I shall receive. But let not him call me cruel, or homicide to whom whom I make no promise, upon whom I practice no deception, whom I neither entice nor receive. It has not been so far the will of heaven that I should love by fate, and to expect me to love by choice is idle. Let this general declaration serve for each of my suitors on his own account, and let it be understood from this time forth that if any one dies for me, it is not of jealousy or misery he dies, for she who loves no one can give no cause for jealousy to any, and candor is not to be confounded with scorn. Let him who calls me wild beast and basilisk leave me alone as something noxious and evil. Let him who calls me ungrateful withhold his service. Who calls me wayward, seek not my acquaintance. Who calls me cruel, pursue me not. For this wild beast, this basilisk, this ungrateful, cruel, wayward being, has no kind of desire to seek, serve, know, or follow them. If Chrysostom's impatience and violent passion killed him, why should my modest behavior and circumspection be blamed? If I preserve my purity in the society of the trees, why should he who would have me preserve it among men seek to rob me of it? I have, as you know, wealth of my own, and I covet not that of others. My taste is for freedom, and I have no relish for constraint. I neither love nor hate any one. I do not deceive this one, or court that, or trifle with one, or play with another. The modest converse of the shepherd-girls of these hamlets and the care of my goats are my recreations. 
My desires are bounded by these mountains, and if they ever wander hence it is to contemplate the beauty of the heavens, steps by which the soul travels to its primeval abode. With these words, and not waiting to hear a reply, she turned and passed into the thickest part of a wood that was hard by, leaving all who were there lost in admiration as much of her good sense as of her beauty. Some, those wounded by the irresistible shafts launched by her bright eyes, made as though they would follow her heedless of the frank declaration they had heard, seeing which, and deeming this a fitting occasion for the exercise of his chivalry in aid of distressed damsels, Don Quixote, laying his hand on the hilt of his sword, exclaimed in a loud and distinct voice, Let no one, whatever his rank or condition, dare to follow the beautiful Marcella, under pain of incurring my fierce indignation, she has shown by clear and satisfactory arguments that little or no fault is to be found with her for the death of Chrysostom, and also how far she is from yielding to the wishes of any of her lovers, for which reason, instead of being followed and persecuted, she should in justice be honored and esteemed by all the good people of the world, for she shows that she is the only woman in it that holds to such a virtuous resolution. Whether it was because of the threats of Don Quixote, or because Ambrosio told them to fulfill their duty to their good friend, none of the shepherds moved or stirred from the spot until having finished the grave and burned chrysostom's papers they laid his body in it not without many tears from those who stood by they closed the grave with a heavy stone until a slab was ready which ambrosio said he meant to have prepared with an epitaph which was to be to this effect. Beneath the stone before your eyes the body of a lover lies. In life he was a shepherd swain, in death a victim to disdain. Ungrateful, cruel, coy, and fair was she that drove him to despair, and love hath made her his ally for spreading wide his tyranny. They then strewed upon the grave a profusion of flowers and branches, and all expressing their condolence with his friend Ambrosio, took their Vivaldo, and his companion did the same. And Don Quixote bade farewell to his hosts and to the travellers, who pressed him to come with them to Seville, as being such a convenient place for finding adventures for they presented themselves in every street and round every corner oftener than anywhere else. Don Quixote thanked them for their advice and for the disposition they showed to do him a favor, and said that for the present he would not and must not go to Seville until he had cleared all these mountains of highwaymen and robbers, of whom report said they were full. Seeing his good intention, the travellers were unwilling to press him further, and once more bidding him farewell, they left him and pursued their journey, in the course of which they did not fail to discuss the story of Marcella and Chrysostom, as well as the madness of Don Quixote. He, on his part, resolved to go in quest of the shepherdess Marcella, and make offer to her of all the service he could render her. But things did not fall out with him as he expected, according to what is related in the course of this veracious history, of which the second part ends here. Ch chapter 15, in which is related the unfortunate adventure that Don Quixote fell in with when he fell out with certain heartless Yanguesans. 
the sage Sidi Hamete Benengele relates that as soon as Don Quixote took leave of his hosts and all who had been present at the burial of Chrysostom, he and his squire passed into the same wood which they had seen the shepherdess Marcella enter, and after having wandered for more than two hours in all directions in search of her without finding her, they came to a halt in a glade covered with tender grass, besides which ran a pleasant cool stream that invited and compelled them to pass there the hours of the noontide heat, which by this time was beginning to come on oppressively. Don Quixote and Sancho dismounted, and turning Rocinante and the ass loose to feed on the grass that there was there in abundance, they ransacked the alforjas, and without any ceremony very peacefully and sociably master and man made their repast on what they found in them. Sancho had not thought it worth while to hobble Rosinante, feeling sure from what he knew of his staidness and freedom from incontinence that all the mares in the Cordova pastures would not lead him into an impropriety. Chance, however, and the devil, who is not always asleep, so ordained it that feeding in this valley there was a drove of Galician ponies belonging to certain young Guazan carriers, whose way it is to take their midday rest with their teams in places and spots where grass and water abound, and that where Don Quixote chanced to be suited the Yanguesan's purpose very well. It so happened, then, that Rosinante took a fancy to disport himself with their ladyships the ponies, and abandoning his usual gait and demeanour as he scented them, he, without asking leave of his master, got up a briskish little trot, and hastened to make known his wishes to them. They, however, it seemed, preferred their pasture to him, and received him with their heels and teeth to such effect that they soon broke his girths and left him naked without a saddle to cover him. But what must have been worse to him was that the carriers, seeing the violence he was offering to their mares, came running up armed with stakes, and so belabored him that they brought him sorely battered to the ground. By this time Don Quixote and Sancho, who had witnessed the drubbing of Rosinante, came up panting and said Don Quixote to Sancho, As far as I can see, friend Sancho, these are not knights, but base folk of low birth. I mention it because thou canst lawfully aid me in taking due vengeance for the insult offered to Rosinante before our eyes. "'What the devil vengeance can we take?' answered Sancho. "'If they are more than twenty, and we no more than two, or indeed, perhaps, not more than one and a half. "'I count for a hundred, replied Don Quixote, and without more words he drew his sword and attacked the Anguazans, and excited and impelled by the example of his master, Sancho did the same, and to begin with Don Quixote delivered a slash at one of them that laid open the leather jerkin he wore, together with a great portion of his shoulder. The Anguazans, seeing themselves assaulted by only two men, while they were so many, betook themselves to their stakes, and driving the two into the middle, they began to lay on with great zeal and energy. In fact, at the second blow they brought Sancho to the ground, and Don Quixote fared the same way, all his skill and high mettle availing him nothing, and fate willed it that he should fall at the feet of Rocinante, who had not yet risen, 
whereby it may seem how furiously stakes can pound in angry boorish hands then seeing the mischief they had done the anguasans with all the haste they could loaded their team and pursued their journey leaving the two adventurers a sorry sight and in sorrier mood sancho was the first to come to and finding himself close to his master he called to him in a weak and doleful voice senor don quixote ah senor don quixote what wouldst thou brother sancho answered don quixote in the same feeble suffering tone as sancho i would like if it were possible answered sancho panza your worship to give me a couple of sups of that potion of the fiery blast, if it be that you have any to hand there. Perhaps it will serve for broken bones as well as for wounds. If I only had it here, wretch that I am, what more should we want? said Don Quixote. But I swear to thee, Sancho Panza, on the faith of a knight errant, ere two days are over, unless fortune orders otherwise i mean to have it in my possession or my hand will have lost its cunning but in how many does your worship think we shall have the use of our feet answered sancho panza for myself i must say i cannot guess how many said the battered knight don quixote but i take all the blame upon myself for I had no business to put hand to sword against men who were not dubbed knights like myself, and so I believe that in punishment for having transgressed the laws of chivalry, the god of battles has permitted this chastisement to be administered to me. For which reason, brother Sancho, it is well thou shouldst receive a hint on the matter which I am now about to mention to thee, for it is of much importance to the welfare of both of us. It is when thou shalt see rabble of this sort offering us insult, thou art not to wait till I draw sword against them, for I shall not do so at all. But do thou draw sword and chastise them to thy heart's content, and if any knights come to their aid in defence, I will take care to defend thee and assail them with all my might, and thou hast already seen by a thousand signs and proofs what the might of this strong arm of mine is equal to. So uplifted had the poor gentleman become th through the victory over the stout Biscayan. But Sancho did not so fully approve of his master's admonition as to let it pass without saying in reply, Senor, I am a man of peace, meek and quiet, and I can put up with any affront, because I have a wife of children to support and bring up. So let it be likewise a hint to your worship, as it cannot be a mandate, that on no account will I draw sword either against clown or against knight, and that here before God I forgive the insults that have been offered me, whether they have been, are, or shall be offered me by high or low, rich or poor, noble or commoner, not accepting any rank or condition whatsoever. To all which his master said in reply, I wish I had breath enough to speak somewhat easily, and that the pain I feel on this side would abate so as to let me explain to thee, Panza, the mistake thou makest. Come now, sinner, suppose the winds of fortune, hitherto so adverse, should turn in our favor, filling the sails of our desires so that safely and without impediment we put into port in some one of those islands i have promised thee how would it be with thee if on winning it i made thee lord of it 
why thou wilt make it well-nigh impossible through not being a knight nor having any desire to be one nor possessing the courage nor the will to avenge insults or defend thy lordship for thou must know that in newly conquered kingdoms and provinces the minds of the inhabitants are never so quiet nor so well disposed to the new lord that there is no fear of their making some move to change matters once more and try as they say what chance may do for them so it is essential that the new possessor should have good sense to enable him to govern and valour to attack and defend himself whatever may befall him in what has now befallen us answered sancho i'd have been well pleased to have that good sense and that valour your worship speaks of but i swear on the faith of a poor man i am more fit for plasters than for arguments see if your worship can get up and let us help rosinante though he does not deserve it for he was the main cause of all this thrashing i never thought it of rosinante for i took him to be a virtuous person and as quiet as myself after all they say right that it takes a long time to come to know people and that there is nothing sure in this life who would have said it after such mighty slashes as your worship gave that unlucky knight errant there was coming travelling post and at the very heels of them such a great storm of sticks as has fallen upon our shoulders and yet thine sancho replied don quixote ought to be used to such squalls but mine reared in soft cloth and fine linen it is plain they must feel more keenly the pain of this mishap and if it were not that i imagine why do i say imagine know of a certainty that all these annoyances are very n necessary accompaniments of the calling of arms i would lay me down here to die of pure vexation to this the squire replied senor as these mishaps are what one reaps of chivalry tell me if they happen very often or if they have their own fixed time for coming to pass because it seems to me that after two harvests we shall be no good for the third unless god in his infinite mercy helps us no friend sancho answered don quixote that the life of knight errant is subject to a thousand dangers and reverses and neither more nor less is it within immediate possibility for knights errant to become kings and emperors as experience has shown in the case of many different knights with whose histories i am thoroughly acquainted and i could tell thee now if the pain would let me of some who simply by might of arm have risen to the high stations i have mentioned and those same both before and after experienced diverse misfortunes and miseries for the valiant Amadis of Gaul found himself in the power of his mortal enemy Archelaus, the magician, who, it is positively asserted, holding him captive, gave him more than two hundred lashes with the reins of his horse while tied to one of the pillars of a court. And, moreover, there is a certain recondite author of no small authority who says that the knight of phoebus being caught in a certain pitfall which opened under his feet in a certain castle on falling found himself bound hand and foot in a deep pit underground where they administered to him one of those things they call clysters of sand and snow-water that well-nigh finished him and if he had not been succoured in that sore extremity by a sage a great friend of his it would have gone very hard with the poor knight so i may well suffer in company with such worthy folk 
for greater were the indignities which they had to suffer than those which we suffer. For I would have thee know, Sancho, that wounds caused by any instruments which happen by chance to be in hand inflict no indignity. And this is laid down in the law of the duel in express words. If, for instance, the cobbler strikes another with the last which he has in his hand, though it be in fact a piece of wood, it cannot be said for that reason that he whom he struck with it has been cudgelled. I say this lest thou shouldst imagine that because we have been drubbed in this affray, we have therefore suffered any indignity. For the arms those men carried, with which they pounded us, were nothing more than their stakes, and not one of them, so far as I remember, carried rapier, sword, or dagger. They gave me no time to see that much, answered Sancho, for hardly had I lay hand on my tizona when they signed the cross on my shoulders with their sticks in such style that they took the sight out of my eyes and the strength out of my feet, stretching me where I now lie, and where thinking of whether all those stake strokes were an indignity or not gives me no uneasiness which the pain of the blow does, for they will remain as deeply impressed on my memory as on my shoulders. For all that let me tell thee, brother Panza, said Don Quixote, that there is no recollection which time does not put an end to, and no pain which death does not remove. And what greater misfortune can there be, replied Panza, than the one that waits for time to put an end to it and death remove it. If our mishap were not one of those that are cured with a couple of plasters, it would not be so bad. But I am beginning to think that all the plasters in a hospital almost won't be enough to put us right. No more of that plunk strength out of weakness, Sancho, as I mean to do, returned Don Quixote and let us see how Rosinante is, for it seems to me that not the least share of this mishap has fallen to the lot of the poor beast. There is nothing wonderful of in that, replied Sancho, since he is a knight-errant too. What I wonder at is that my beast should have come off scot-free where we came out scotched. Fortune always leaves a door open in adversity, in order to bring relief to it, said Don Quixote. I say so because this little beast may now supply the want of Rosinante, carrying me hence to some castle where I may be cured of my wounds, and moreover I shall not hold it any dishonor to be so mounted, for I remember having read how the good old Salinas, the tutor an instructor of the gay god of laughter, when he entered the city of the hundred gates, went very contentedly mounted on a handsome ass. It may be true that he went mounted, as your worship says, answered Sancho, but there is a great difference between going mounted and going slung like a sack of manure. To which Don Quixote replied, Wounds received in battle confer honor instead of taking it away. And so, friend Panza, say no more. But, as I told thee before, get up as well as thou canst, and put me on top of thy beast in whatever fashion pleases thee best. And let us go hence, ere night comes on, and surprise us in these wilds. And yet I have heard your worship say, observed Panza, that it is very meet for knights errant to sleep in wastes and deserts, and that they esteem it very good fortune. That is, said Don Quixote, when they cannot help it, or when they are in love. And so true is this, that there have been knights who have remained two years on rocks 
in sunshine and shade and all the inclemencies of heaven, without their ladies knowing anything of it. And one of these was Amadis, when, under the name of Beltenebras, he took up his abode on the Penapobra, for I know not if it was eight years or eight months, for I am not very sure of the reckoning. At any rate, he stayed there doing penance, for I know not what pique the Princess Oriana had against him. But no more of this now, Sancho, and make haste before a mishap like Rosinante's befalls the ass. The very devil would be in it in that case, said Sancho, and letting off thirty o's and sixty sighs and a hundred and twenty maledictions and execrations on whomsoever it was that had brought him there, he raised himself, stopping halfway bent like a Turkish bow without power to bring himself upright. But with all his pains he saddled his ass, who too had gone astray somewhat, yielding to the excessive license of the day. He next raised up Rosinante, and as for him, had he possessed a tongue to complain with, most assuredly neither Sancho nor his master would have been behind him. To be brief, Sancho fixed Don Quixote on the ass and secured Rosinante with a leading rein and taking the ass by the halter, he proceeded more or less in the direction in which it seemed to him the high road might be, and, as chance was conducting their affairs for them from good to better, he had not gone a short league when the road came in sight, and on it he perceived an inn, which to his annoyance and to the delight of Don Quixote must needs be a castle. Sancho insisted that it was an inn, and his master that it was not one, but a castle, and the dispute lasted so long that before the point was settled they had time to reach it, and into it Sancho entered with all his team without any further controversy. End of chapter 15This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Part 6. Chapter 16. Of what happened to the ingenious gentleman in the inn, which he took to be a castle. The innkeeper, seeing Don Quixote slung across the ass, asked Sancho what was amiss with him. Sancho answered that it was nothing, only that he had fallen down from a rock and had his ribs a little bruised. The innkeeper had a wife, whose disposition was not such as those of her calling commonly have, for she was by nature kind-hearted and felt for the sufferings of her neighbours, so she at once set about tending Don Quixote, and made her young daughter, a very comely girl, help her in taking care of her guest. There was besides in the inn, as servant, an Asturian lass with a broad face, flat pole, and snub nose, blind of one eye and not very sound in the other. The elegance of her shape, to be sure, made up for all her defects. She did not measure seven palms from head to foot, and her shoulders, which overweighted her somewhat, made her contemplate the ground more than she liked. This graceful lass, then, helped the young girl, and the two made up a very bad bed for Don Quixote in a garret that showed evident signs of having formerly served for many years as a straw loft, in which there was also quartered a carrier, whose bed was placed a little beyond our Don Quixote's, and though only made of the pack saddles and cloths of his mules, had much the advantage of it, as Don Quixote's consisted simply of four rough boards on two not very even trestles, a mattress that for thinness might have passed for a quilt, full of pellets which, were they not seen through the rents to be wool, 
would to the touch have seemed pebbles in hardness. Two sheets made of buckler leather, and a coverlet, the threads of which any one that chose might have counted without missing one in the reckoning. On this accursed bed Don Quixote stretched himself, and the hostess and her daughter soon covered him with plasters from top to toe, while Maritornes, for that was the name of the Asturian, held the light for them, and while plastering him, the hostess, observing how full of wheels Don Quixote was in some places, remarked that this had more the look of blows than of a fall. It was not blows, Sancho said, but that the rock had many points and projections, and that each of them had left its mark. Pray, Signora, he added, manage to save some toe, as there will be no want of someone to use it, for my loins too are rather sore. Then you must have fallen too, said the hostess. I did not fall, said Sancho Panza, but from shock I got at seeing my master fall that I feel as if I had a thousand thwacks. That may well be, said the young girl, for it has many a time happened to me to dream that I was falling down from a tower and never coming to the ground, and when I awoke from the dream to find myself as weak and shaken as if I had really fallen. There is the point, Signora, replied Sancho Panza, that I, without dreaming at all, but being more awake than I am now, find myself with scarcely less wheels than my master Don Quixote. How is the gentleman called? asked Maritornes, the Asturian. Don Quixote of La Mancha, answered Sancho Panza, and he is a knight adventurer, and one of the best and stoutest that have seen the world this long time past. What is a knight adventurer? said the lass. Are you so new in the world as not to know? answered Sancho Panza. Well then, you must know, sister, that a knight adventurer is a thing that in two words is seen drubbed and emperor. That is today the most miserable and needy being in the world, and tomorrow will have two or three crowns of kingdom to give his squire. Then how is it, said the hostess, that belonging to so good a master as this, you have not, to judge by appearances, even so much as a county? It is too soon yet, answered Sancho, for we have only been a month going in quest of adventures, and so far we have met with nothing that can be called one, that when one thing is looked for, another thing is found. However, if my master Don Quixote gets well of this wound, or fall, and I am left none the worse of it, I would not change my hopes for the best title in Spain. To all this conversation Don Quixote was listening very attentively, and sitting in bed as well as he could, and taking the hostess by the hand, he said to her, Believe me, fair lady, you may call yourself fortunate in having in this castle of yours sheltered my person, which is such that if I do not myself praise it, it is because of what is commonly said that self-praise debaseth. But my squire will inform you who I am. I only tell you that I shall preserve forever inscribed on my memory the service you have rendered me in order to tender you my gratitude while life shall last me, and would to heaven love held me not so enthralled and subject to its laws and to the eyes of that fair ingrate whom I name between my teeth, but that those of this lovely damsel might be the masters of my liberty. The hostess, her daughter, and the worthy Maritornes listened in bewilderment listened in bewilderment to the words of the knight-errant, for they understood about as much of them as if he had been talking Greek, though they could perceive they were all meant for expressions of goodwill and blandishments, and not being accustomed to this kind of language, they stared at him and wondered to themselves, for he seemed to them a man of a different sort from those they were used to, and thanking him in pothouse phrase for his civility, they left him, while the Asturian gave her attention to Sancho, who needed it no less than his master. The carrier had made an arrangement with her for recreation that night, and she had given him her word that when the guests were quiet and the family asleep, she would come in search of him and meet his wishes unreservedly. And it is said of this good lass that she never made promises of the kind without fulfilling them, even though she made them in a forest and without any witness present, for she plumed herself greatly on being a lady, and held it no disgrace to be in such an employment as servant in an inn, 
because, she said, misfortunes and ill luck had brought her to that position. The hard, narrow, wretched, rickety bed of Don Quixote stood first in the middle of this starlit stable, and close beside it Sancho made his, which merely consisted of a rush mat and a blanket that looked as if it was of threadbare canvas rather than of wool. Next to these two beds was that of the carrier, made up, as has been said, and all the trappings of the two best mules he had, though there were twelve of them, sleek, plump, and in prime condition, for he was one of the rich carriers of Arevalo, according to the author of this history, who particularly mentions this carrier because he knew him very well, and they even say was in some degree a relation of his. Besides which, Chidi Harnete Benengeli was a historian of great research and accuracy in all things, as is very evident, since he would not pass over in silence those that have been already mentioned, however trifling and insignificant they might be, an example that might be followed by those grave historians who relate transactions so curtly and briefly that we hardly get a taste of them, all the substance of the work being left in the inkstand from carelessness, perverseness, or ignorance. A thousand blessings on the author of Tablante de Ricamonte, and that of the other book in which the deeds of the Conde Tomillas are recounted. With what minuteness they describe everything. To proceed, then, after having paid a visit to his team and given them their second feed, the carrier stretched himself on his pack-saddles and lay waiting for his conscientious maritornes. Sancho was by this time plastered and had laid down, and though he strove to sleep, the pain of his ribs would not let him, while Don Quixote, with the pain of his, had his eyes as wide open as a hare's. The inn was all in silence, and in the whole of it there was no light except that given by a lantern that hung burning in the middle of the gateway. This strange stillness, and the thoughts always present to our knight's mind, of the incidents described at every turn in the books, that were the cause of his misfortune, conjured up to his imagination as extraordinary a delusion as can well be conceived, which was that he fancied himself to have reached a famous castle, for, as has been said, all the inns he lodged in were castles to his eyes, and that the daughter of the innkeeper was daughter of the lord of the castle, and that she, won by his high-bred bearing, had fallen in love with him, and had promised to come to his bed for a while that night, without the knowledge of her parents, and holding all this fantasy that he had constructed as solid fact, he began to feel uneasy, and to consider the perilous risk which his virtue was about to encounter, and he resolved in his heart to commit no treason to his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, even though the Queen Guinevere herself and the Dame Quintanona should present themselves before him. While he was taken up with these vagaries, then, the time and the hour, and a lucky one for him, arrived for the Asturian to come, who in her smock, with bare feet, and her hair gathered into a fustian coif, with noiseless and cautious steps entered the chamber where the three were quartered, in quest of the carrier. But scarcely had she gained the door, when Don Quixote perceived her, and sitting up in his bed, in spite of his plasters and the pain of his ribs, he stretched out his arms to receive his beauteous damsel. The Asturian, who went all doubled up, and in silence with her hands before her, feeling for her lover, encountered the arms of Don Quixote, who grasped her tightly by the wrist, and drawing her towards him, while she dared not utter a word, made her sit down on the bed. He then felt her smock, and, although it was of sackcloth, it appeared to him to be of the finest and softest silk. On her wrists she wore some glass beads, but to him they had the sheen of precious orient pearls. Her hair, which in some measure resembled a horse's mane, he rated as threads of the brightest golds of Araby, whose refulgence dimmed the sun himself. Her breath, which no doubt smelt of yesterday's stale salad, seemed to him to diffuse a sweet aromatic fragrance from her mouth, and in short, he drew her portrait in his imagination, with the same features and in the same style as that which he had seen in his books of the other princesses who, smitten by love, came with all the adornments 
that are here set down, to see the sorely wounded knight, and so great was the poor gentleman's blindness that neither touch nor smell nor anything else about the good lass that would have made any but a carrier vomit were enough to undeceive him. On the contrary, he was persuaded that he had the goddess of beauty in his arms, and holding her firmly in his grasp, he went on to say in a low, tender voice, Would that found myself, lovely and exalted lady, in a position to repay such a favour as that which you, by the sight of your great beauty, have granted me. But fortune, which is never weary of persecuting the good, has chosen to place me upon this bed, where I lie so bruised and broken, that though my inclination would gladly comply with yours, it is impossible. Besides, to this impossibility another yet greater is to be added, which is the faith that I have pledged to the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, sole lady of my most secret thoughts, and were it not that this stood in the way, I should not be so insensible a knight as to miss the happy opportunity which your great goodness has offered me. Maritornes was fretting and sweating at finding herself held so fast by Don Quixote, and not understanding or heeding the words he addressed to her, she strove without speaking to free herself. The worthy carrier, whose unholy thoughts kept him awake, was aware of his doxy the moment she entered the door, and was listening attentively to all Don Quixote said, and jealous that the Asturian should have broken her word with him for another, drew nearer to Don Quixote's bed, and stood still to see what would come of this talk which he could not understand. But when he perceived the wench struggling to get free, and Don Quixote striving to hold her, not relishing the joke, he raised his arm and delivered such a terrible cuff on the lank jaws of the amorous knight, that he bathed all his mouth in blood, and not content with this, he mounted on his ribs, and with his feet tramped all over them at a pace rather smarter than a trot. The bed, which was somewhat crazy and not very firm on its feet, unable to support the additional weight of the carrier, came to the ground, and at the mighty crash of this the innkeeper awoke, and at once concluded that it must be some brawl of Maritornes, because after calling loudly to her he got no answer. With this suspicion he got up, and lighting a lamp, hastened to the quarter where he had heard the disturbance. The wench, seeing that her master was coming, and knowing that his temper was terrible, frightened and panic-stricken, made for the bed of Sancho Panza, who still slept, and crouching upon it, made a ball of herself. The innkeeper came in, exclaiming, "'Where art thou, strumpet? Of course this is some of thy work.' At this Sancho awoke, and feeling this mass almost on top of him, fancied he had a nightmare, and began to distribute fisticuffs all around, of which a certain share fell upon Maritornes, who, irritated by the pain and flinging modesty aside, paid back so many in return to Sancho that she woke him up in spite of himself. He then, finding himself so handled, by whom he knew not, raising himself up as well as he could, grappled with Maritornes, and he and she between them began the bitterest and drollest scrimmage in the world. The carrier, however, perceiving by the light of the innkeeper candle how it fared with his lady love, quitting Don Quixote, ran to bring her the help she needed, and the innkeeper did the same, but with a different intention, for his was to chastise the lass, as he believed that beyond a doubt she alone was the cause of all the harmony. And so, as the saying is, Catch to rat, rat to rope, rope to stick. The carrier pounded Sancho, Sancho the lass, she him, and the innkeeper her, and all worked away so briskly that they did not give themselves a moment's rest, and the best of it was that the innkeeper's lamp went out, and as they were left in the dark, they all laid on one upon the other in a mass so unmercifully that there was not a sound spot left where a hand could light. It so happened that there was lodging that night in the inn a quadrillo of what they call the old holy brotherhood of Toledo, who also hearing the extraordinary noise of the conflict, seized his staff and the tin case with his warrants, and made his way in the dark into the room, crying, Hold! In the name of jurisdiction! Hold! In the name of the holy brotherhood! The first that he came upon was the pummeled Don Quixote, who lay stretched senseless on his back, 
upon his broken-down bed, and his hand falling on the beard, as he felt about, he continued to cry, "'Help for the jurisdiction!' But perceiving that he whom he had laid hold of did not move or stir, he concluded that he was dead, and that those in the room were his murderers, and with this suspicion he raised his voice still higher, calling out, "'Shut the ingate! See that no one goes out! They have killed a man here!' This cry startled them all, and each dropped the contest at the point at which the voice reached him. The innkeeper retreated to his room, the carrier to his pack-saddles, the lass to her crib. The unlucky Don Quixote and Sancho alone were unable to move from where they were. The quadrillero on this let go Don Quixote's beard, and went out to look for a light to search for, and apprehend the culprits, but not finding one, as the innkeeper had purposely, extinguished the lantern on retreating to his room, he was compelled to have recourse to the hearth, where after much time and trouble he lit another lamp. End of chapter 16 Recorded by Gesine in April 2007
By this time the quadrarero had succeeded in lighting the lamp, and came in to see the men that he had thought been killed, and as Sancho caught sight of him at the door, seeing him coming in a shirt with a cloth on his head and a lamp in his hand, and a very forbidden countenance, he said to his master, Senor, can it be that this the enchanted moor coming back to give us more castination if there anything still left in the ink bottle? It cannot be the moor, answered Don Quixote, for those under enchantment do not let themselves be seen by any one. If they do not let themselves be seen, they let themselves be felt, said Sancho. If not, let my shoulders speak to the point. Mine could speak too, said Don Quixote, but that is not a sufficient reason for believing that what we see is the enchanted moor. The officer came up, and finding them engaged in such a peaceful conversation, stood amazed, though Don Quixote, to be sure, still lay on his back, unable to move from pure pummeling and plasters. The officer turned to him and said, Well, how goes it, good man? I would speak more politely if I were you, replied Don Quixote. Is it the way of this country to address knight errands in that style, you booby? The quadrurero, finding himself so disrespectfully treated by such a sorry-looking individual, lost his temper, and raising the lamp full of oil, smote Don Quixote with such a blow with it on the head that he gave him a badly broken pate. Then, all being in darkness, he went out, and Sancho Panza said, That is certainly the enchanted moor, senor, and he keeps the treasure for others, and for us only the cuffs and lamp-wax. That is the truth, answered Don Quixote, and there is no use of troubling oneself about these matters of enchantment or being angry or vexed at them, for as they are as invisible and visionary we shall find no one on whom to avenge ourselves. Do what we may rise, Sancho, if thou canst, and call the alcade of this forest, and get him to give me a little oil, wine, salt, and rosemary to make the sorcerer's balsam, for indeed I believe that I have great need of it now, because I am losing much blood from the wound that Phantom gave me. Sancho got up with pain enough in his bones, and went after the innkeeper in the dark, and meeting the officer, who was looking to see what had become of his enemy, he said to him, Senor, whoever you are, do us the favor and kindness to give us a little rosemary, oil, salt, and wine, for it is wanted to cure one of our best knights errant on earth, who lies on yonder bed, wounded by the hands of the enchanted moor that is in this inn. When the officer heard him talk in this way, he took him for a man out of his senses, and as day was now beginning to break, he opened the inn gate, and calling the host, he told him what this good man wanted. The host furnished him with what he required, and Sancho brought it to Don Quixote, who, with his hand to his head, was bewailing the pain of the blow of the lamp, which had done him no more than raising a couple of rather large lumps, and what he fancied blood was only the sweat that flowed from him in his sufferings during the late storm. To be brief, he took the materials of which he made a compound, mixing them all and boiling them a good while it until it seemed to him they had come to perfection he then asked for some vial to pour it into and there was not one in the inn he decided on putting it into a tin oil bottle or flask of which the host made him a free gift and over the flask he repeated more than eighty paternosters and as many more ave marias salves and credos accompanying each word with a cross by the way of benediction at all which there were present sancho the innkeeper and the quadrurero for the carrier was now peacefully engaged in attending to the comfort of his mules this being accomplished he felt anxious to make trial himself on the spot of the virtue of this precious balsam and as he considered it and so he drank near a quart of what could not be put into the flask and remained in the pigskin in which it had been boiled but scarcely had he done drinking when he began to vomit in such a way that nothing was left in his stomach and with the pangs and spasms of vomiting he broke into a profuse sweat on account of which he bade them cover him up and leave him alone they did so and he lay sleeping more than three hours at the end of which he awoke and felt great bodily relief and so much ease from his bruises that he thought himself quite cured and verily believed that he had hit upon the balsam of fair brass and that with this remedy he might thenceforward without any fear face any kind of destruction battle or combat however perilous it might be sancho panza who also regarded the amendment of his master as miraculous begged him to give him what was left in the pigskin which was no small quantity Don Quixote consented, and he, taking it with both hands, in good faith and with a better will, gulped it down and drained off very little less than his master. But the fact is that the stomach of poor Sancho was of necessity not so delicate as that of his master, and so, before vomiting, he was seized with such gripings and retchings and such sweats and faintness that verily and truly be believed his last hour had come, and finding himself so racked and tormented, he cursed the balls and the thief that had given it to him. Don Quixote, seeing him in this state, said, It is my belief, Sancho, that this mischief comes not of thy being dubbed a knight, for I am persuaded this liquor cannot be good for those who are not so. If your worship knew that, returned Sancho, woe betide me and all my kindred, why did you let me taste it? 
At this moment the draught took effect, and the poor squire began to discharge both ways at such a rate that the rush mat on which he had thrown himself and the canvas blanket he had covered him were fit for nothing afterwards. He sweated and perspired with such paroxysms and convulsions that not only he himself, but all the present thought his end had come. This tempest and tribulation lasted about two hours, at the end of which he was left, not like his master, but so weak and exhausted that he could not stand. Don Quixote, however, was, as has been said, felt himself relieved and well, and was eager to take his departure at once in quest of adventures, as it seemed to him that all the time he loitered there was a fraud upon the world and those in it who stood in need of his help and protection, all the more when he had the security and confidence in Balsam afforded him. And so, urged by this impulse, he saddled Riconante himself and put the pack saddle on his squire's breast, whom likewise he helped to dress and mount the ass, after which he mounted his horse, and turning to a corner of the inn, he laid hold of a pike that stood there, to serve him by way of a lance. All that were in the inn, who were more than twenty persons, stood watching him. The innkeeper's daughter was likewise observing him, and he too never took his eyes off her, and from time to time fetched a sigh that he seemed to pluck up from the dust of his bowels, but they all thought it must be from the pain he felt in his ribs, and at any rate they who had seen him plastered the night before thought so. As soon as they both mounted at the gate of the inn, he called to the host and said in a very grave and measured voice, Many and great are the favors, Signor Alcade, and that I have received in this castle of yours and i remain under the deepest obligation to be grateful to you for them all the days of my life if i can repay them in avenging you of any arrogant foe who may have wronged you know that my calling is no other than to aid the weak to avenge those who suffer wrong and to chastise perfidy search your memory and if you find anything of this kind you need only tell me of it and i promise you by the order of knighthood which i have received to procure you satisfaction and reparation to the utmost of your desire the innkeeper boy to him with equal calmness sir knight i do not want your worship to avenge me of any wrong because when any is done me i can take what vengeance seems good to me the only thing i want is that you pay me the score that you have run up in the inn last night as well for the straw and barley of your two beasts as for supper and beds then this is an inn said don quixote and a very respectable one said the innkeeper i have been under a mistake all this time answered don quixote for in truth i thought this was a castle and not a bad one but since it appears that it is not a castle but an inn all that can be done now is that you should excuse the payment for i cannot contravene the rules of knight errant of whom i know as a fact and up to the present i have read nothing to the contrary that they never paid for lodging or anything else in the inn where they might be for any hospitality that might be offered them is their due by law and right in return for the insufferable toil they endure in seeking adventures by night and by day in summer and in winter on foot and on horseback in hunger and thirst cold and heat exposed to all the inclemencies of heaven and the hardships of earth I have little to do with that, replied the innkeeper. Pay me what you owe me, and let us have no more talk of chivalry, for all I care about is to get my money. You are a stupid, scurvy innkeeper, said Don Quixote, and putting spurs to Riconante and bringing his pike to the slope, he rode out of the inn before anyone could stop him, and pushed on some distance without looking to see if his squire was following him. The innkeeper, when he saw him go without paying him, ran to get payment of Sancho, who said that as his master would not pay, neither would he because being as he was squire to a knight errant the same rule and reason how good for him as for his master with regard to not paying anything in inns and holsteries and at this the innkeeper waxed very wroth and threatened if he did not pay to compel him in a way that he would not like to which sancho made answer that by the law of chivalry his master had received he would not pay a rap though it cost him his life for the excellent and ancient usage of nice errands was not going to be violated by him, nor should the squires of such as were yet to come into the world ever complain of him or reproach him without breaking so just a privilege. The ill luck of the unfortunate Sancho so ordered that among the company in the inn there were four wool carters from Segovia, three needle makers from the colts of Cordoba, and two lodgers from this fair Seville, lively fellows, tender hearted, fond of a joke, and playful who almost as if instigated and moved by a common impulse made up to sancho and dismounted him from his ass while one of them went in for the blanket of the host's bed but on flinging him into they looked up and seeing that the ceiling was somewhat lower than what they required for their work they decided upon going out into the yard which was bounded by the sky and there putting sancho in the middle of the blanket they began to raise him high making sport with him as they would with a dog at strove tide 
The cries of the poor blanketed wretch were so loud that they reached the ears of his master, who, halting to listen attentively, was persuaded that some new adventure was coming, until he clearly perceived that it was his squire who uttered them. Wheeling about, he came up to the inn with a laborious gallop, and finding it shut, went round to see if he could find some way of getting in. But as soon as he came to the wall of the yard, which was not very high, he discovered the game that was being played with his squire. He saw him rising and falling in the air with such grace and nimbleness that, had his rage allowed him, it is my belief he would have laughed. He tried to climb from his horse on to the top of the wall, but he was so bruised and battered that he could not even dismount. And so, from the back of his horse, he began to utter such maledictions and objurgations against those who were blankety Sancho as it would be impossible to write down accurately. They, however, did not stay their laughter or their work for this, nor did the flying Sancho seize his lamentations, mingled now with threats, now the entreaties, but all to little purpose, or none at all, until from pure weariness they left off. They then brought him his ass, and mounting him on top of it, they put his jacket round him, and the compassionate Maritone, seeing him so exhausted, thought fit to refresh him with a jug of water, and that it might be all the cooler she fetched it from the well. Sancho took it, and as he was raising it to his mouth, he was stopped by the cries of his master, exclaiming, "'Sancho, my son, drink not water, drink it not, my son, for it will kill thee. See, here I have the blessed balsam,' and he held up the flask of liquor, "'and with drinking two drops of it thou wilt certainly be restored.' At these words Sancho turned his eyes a squint, and in a still louder voice said, "'Can it be your worship has forgotten that I am not a knight, or do you want me to end up by vomiting what bowels I have left after last night?' Keep your liquor in the name of all the devils, and leave me to myself. And at one and the same instant he left off talking and began drinking. But as the first sup he proceeded to his water, he did not care to go on with it, and begged Meritornius to fetch him some wine, which she did with a right good will and paid for with her own money. For indeed they say of her that, though she was in that line of life, there is some faint and distant resemblance to a Christian about her when sancho had done drinking he dug his heels into his ass and the gate of the inn being thrown open he passed out very well pleased at having paid nothing and carried his point though it had been at the expense of his usual sureties his shoulders it is true that the innkeeper detained his all forges in payment of what was owing to him but sancho took his departure in such a flurry that he never missed him the innkeeper, as soon as he saw him off, wanted to bar the gate close, but the blanketers would not agree to it, for they were fellows who would not have cared two farthings for Don Quixote, even had he been really one of the knight errants of the round table. End of part nine, chapter seventeen.